And uh, once again, from one more, happy Mother's Day. And Mother's Day is a great day. I remember when I was a kid. You know, so much has changed in our culture. But when I was a kid growing up, uh, just a little guy, uh, Mother's Day was a big day in our church. As a matter of fact, uh, we all wore suits to church. I still do. And... Uh, <clears throat> And uh, on Mother's Day, we would, we would wear a little boutonniere, a little uh, flower in our lapel. And uh, <clears throat> it was interesting because if you didn't have one, the church just happened to have some there. And they had white ones and they had pink ones. And so you would come in and they would ask you if you didn't have your little boutonniere on, they would say, is your mother living? And of course we would say yes. We would get a white one. But if your mom had already passed, they'd give you a pink one. And, uh, but it was a big day, and it was a big day to remember moms. And uh, I remember in uh, my former church, uh, <clears throat> the youth pastor I had used to say, well, you know, uh, mothers, Sort of like your nose. Everybody has one. And that's true. You think about it. You know something? When you get as old as I am, and I'm getting pretty old, you've sort of experienced it all. Not every situation, but certainly every category of situations. When I was a little kid, I had my mom kiss away my tears. And I have also stood by the grave of my mother and father as they passed into eternity. As a kid, I couldn't wait to grow up. But before I knew it, life was almost over. I got married, and I experienced the joys of the birth of my four children. And I've buried one of them. I have experienced great victories in my life. I have experienced great defeats. I have had many good friends in my lifetime, and I have also been terribly betrayed. And I have had a job. And I have lost my job. I've been treated fairly, and I've been treated very unfairly. Whatever life has to offer, I've experienced some version of it. I used to tell our youth groups and people, as I was younger, but they were much younger than me, and I'd say, guys, I want to tell you, whatever you're facing in life, I've already been there. Now listen to what I'm telling you. I've gone through it. Well, whatever life has to offer, I've been there, and I've experienced some version of it all. So on this Mother's Day, listen to the counsel of an old man. Listen to the counsel of God's Word. What I'm seeing today in society is women, moms, chasing after the wind, trying to find joy and fulfillment in life but in all the wrong ways. 
So that's why I've entitled this message this morning, The Fulfilled Christian Mother. What is the answer? What is God's answer to the situation? Now, I, I have to give you just a little bit of a disclaimer this morning. I spent several weeks trying to just decide what passage God wanted me to speak on today. And I was all over the Bible. I was through previous messages. I had did everything. I couldn't get away from this passage. But this passage is one of the hardest probably in the whole Bible. And I was trying to get away from it. But this is what God says, nevertheless. And so I invite you this morning to turn with me to 1 Timothy 2. And we're going to read verses 5 through 15 of this passage. And I've sort of extended it a little bit to give the background. And I hope it doesn't scare you off and make you close your ears till, we, till you hear what we're going to say this morning. So in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at 5, Paul is bringing a challenge to the church. Actually, he's given Timothy the challenge, and, and he is writing to Timothy and trying to teach Timothy how to lead the church of God. And so beginning in verse 5, we'll break into the subjects, and he says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and, man, and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Which is the testimony given at this proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire that in every place, and he's talking about local churches here, he says, I desire that in every place the men should pray. Lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Just let me just break right here for one moment and say this. There is so much we could say about fathers and about men. And I hope, I don't know who's preaching on Father's Day, but I hope they give it to us. Because we need it. But this is Mother's Day. And uh, so we're going to be talking particularly to the ladies. And so in verse 9, he continues and he says, Likewise also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable attire with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman, a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet, she will be saved through childbearing. Before you draw conclusions, wait till we get there. If they continue, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Wow. What a scary passage, huh? I want you to know this morning that it's Mom's Day and we're primarily talking to mothers. However, I'm talking this morning to all women and girls. This is God's word. Well, that brings us then to our big idea. What is this passage driving at? And uh, so we're going to start right off with a big idea. 
And, and our big idea, what we're moving toward this morning, and want to try to demonstrate as we move through, is the, that we can only find real joy when we live in harmony with the way, what? God made us. You know, <laughs> we, we think that we can sort of invent our own way of living a lot of times. And we begin to chase the wind, as we said. One problem with chasing the wind, you'll never catch it. And there's a lot of wind coming behind as well. But this morning I'd like to talk to you about Three things for moms to remember. Here they are. Number one, remember how God created you. All right? Number two, remember how sin affected you. And number three, remember how God sets you free. Now we're going to look at all three of these. We're really only going to consider the last couple verses of that passage I read because we don't have time to go through it all. But number one, number one as we're uh, looking at this passage in verse 13, uh, Paul said to Timothy, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And uh, so uh, as I thought about that, I thought, well, really, form, this is the creation. Adam was created first and then Eve. And so, he sa so uh, we're saying, remember how God created you. You know, if we go all the way back to the Genesis account, this is what we read in Genesis 1, 27 and 28. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created who? Him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds uh, of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You see, God Number one is your creator, and he created you, he created me, he created each one of us according to his sovereign plan. We didn't have a choice as to who we would be. It was God's plan. He created us. He created us in his own image. But you know, the image of God really refers primarily, secondarily to different things. But the one I want to talk about this morning is God, it was, God is in the form of unity and plurality. There is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are three persons, but there is only one God. There is unity, there is plurality. And I thought of this when I thought of the passage uh, that we were created in the image of God. He created him, male and female. Do you realize And then there came a point when God separated male and female and he took the rib from Adam and he formed the female, the woman, and each would play their part, but there was a unity because God tells us further on in chapter 2 of the book of Genesis that man would leave his father and his mother, he would cleave to his wife, and the two would become what? One. There is a plurality, and yet there is a unity. God created him, male and female, then he separated them, then he brought them back together. This is what we're talking about in the verse, I believe it was Keith, when he was preaching in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, said, this, uh, there is neither, and this is in Christ now, in, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. 
The whole world for the Jewish people is divided into two categories, the Jews and those who were not Jews. The God's called people and the rest of the world, sometimes called the Jews and the nations. We use the word Gentiles for the nations. And so there, was, uh, there were the Jews and the Gentiles. And in Jesus' time, they referred to the Gentiles as the Greeks because they lived in this Greek world. And if you weren't a Jew, you were in some way a Greek because Greece had, up just until just before this time, had ruled the world, the whole known world at that time, uh, to them, uh, was living according to Greek culture. And so... Paul is saying here, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. Listen, in Christ, there is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Listen, I want to tell you this morning something that you've heard many times. That in Christ... Uh, in Christ, men and women are of equal value. God does not love men more than he loves women. God had a plan. He created us. We are a unity, and God brings us together in that unity and uh, to fulfill his very purposes in the world. And you see, one of the first commands, if not the first that he gave the man, was procreation. This was God's plan. Listen, having children was not a result of the fall. It was not a curse. It was the blessing of God right from creation. And we read that passage where he said, where God said to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Man had not yet sinned. And so in order to do that, he made male and he made female in order that we might fulfill that command. And by the way, that command has never been retracted in all of history. However, <clears throat> there are very, very distinct differences in our roles. Men are not women. Women are not men. God has designed each of us according to his plan, to his plan to carry out his purposes in the world. According to Gary Smalley, uh, he was quite a notorious uh, speaker on marriage and home life, etc., a few years ago. And uh, he said this, and God designed them accordingly. He said this, Every cell in our bodies, men and women, is different. Our muscle tone is different. We see women you know, working out. They're never going to bulk up like men. Our muscle tone is different. Our bone structure is different. Here's one probably you ladies uh, have known all along. Men's skulls are thicker than women's. <laughs> now, I know you knew that. Our body shapes are different. Our brains are different. You see, men tend to think unilaterally. That is on one side of the brain, the left side. And uh, women tend to think bilaterally. They use both sides a lot better than we do as men. But they favor the right side of the brain. This right side of the brain is the feeling side. It is the nurturing side of the brain. It is the emotion side of the brain. And uh, men... Uh, on the left side of the brain, 
they, uh, they uh, think more in terms of logic and facts and conquering, etc. So uh, even nature itself shows us that there is a very strong difference between male and female, and God designed it that way. It is the God of the universe, the creator God that made us who we are. There was a specific order in our creation. Now, the first to create what was created, of course, was Adam. And uh, he was first, he was created to be the leader. We can see this without question in the book of Genesis and throughout uh, the rest of Scripture. Uh, he was the one that God spoke to before Eve was even created and gave his commands to mankind, uh, for mankind too. He gave them to Adam. And then he took the rib from Adam. He created the woman. She was created to be a helper. She would not lead independently of Adam but she would help assist Adam as he carried out God's command. She would be a companion to Adam. Listen, she would be Adam's lover. She would be the mother of their children. She was made to be the nurturer, if you will, of the children. Man and woman would only reach their greatest joy and their greatest fulfillment within the roles that God has given them. Now I have to tell you, and it's no news to you, in our generation we are seeing those, rule, those roles blurred. And this is one of the signs, by the way, of a society that is failing, a society that is deteriorating. I was thinking today, as you look back on history, or I was thinking yesterday, as you look back on history, you see normally that the women are the ones that are keeping our society on track. When, when feminine morality begins to generate, the whole of society collapses. And we see that in Romans chapter 1. Today we are seeing our whole society turned upside down. We are seeing men who want to be women and women who want to be men. We're seeing homosexuality becoming a plague in our society. The difference between the sexes is being wiped out. Boys don't know who they are, so they want to be girls. Girls don't know who they are, so they want to be the boys. Each is trying to fulfill his life in accordance with their own individual ideas. Feminism today has totally distorted God's role for men and women. And this is one of the reasons I really believe that our society in America is disappearing and evaporating before our eyes. This has caused a deep frustration. It has caused anxiety. It has caused worry. It has caused depression uh, in both men and women. But remember that God is the creator. God knew what he was doing. Who were we to come along and say, oh, God, you didn't know what you're doing, you were doing? I want to I wanna be a woman. I want to be a man. Or to just merely absorb the roles 
of the other. Well, remember how God created you. Remember how sin affected you. You see, Eve was deceived by Satan's lie. But Adam, really as the leader, failed Eve and he failed God. Adam was not there to protect her. Adam was to be the protector. Adam followed Eve into sin and ate of the fruit. She may, she may have sinned first, but she was deceived. Adam was not deceived. He just walked in and grabbed it and ate it. You see, Adam was the leader, and he was held responsible. However, Eve's sin brought death. Now, you remember when we read uh, in verse 13, it said, For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived, and became a transgressor. So Eve became the transgressor, and that transgression passed on to the rest of society. Now there were consequences. Do you realize there are always consequences to sin? And uh, there were two consequences for Eve. We're not talking about Adam today. There were consequences for him. For Eve, there were two consequences. Genesis 3.16 says this. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation because I think it's much clearer. Then he said, that is God said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. Was God right or wrong, ladies? But listen to the second one. second one is probably the more scary one. And you, talking to Eve, and you will desire to control your husband. But he will rule over you. You see, she would bear children in pain. Uh, and that was her punishment, not the bearing of the children, as we men mentioned. But she would now have an innate desire to usurp the authority of her husband. She would seek to rule over him. Now, understand this, in both parts of this section where God is talking to the woman. Understand that this is not a command. He's not commanding men to rule over their wives. He's not commanding women to take up the authority in the home or in the church or wherever. He's just merely stating a fact that this is how sin was going to affect them. And so the home would from that time forward be a battleground. Now this is naturally. We need to work so this doesn't happen in our lives. But this is the natural result and Eve was warned. You see, Eve would try to usurp the authority of her husband, but she wasn't, going to succeed, she wasn't going to succeed because he was going to rule over her. He's bigger, he's stronger, and uh, he was going to rule. This was a test of the wills. Well, listen, remember how God created you, male and female. 
Remember the consequences of sin that have happened in the world. But ladies, listen to this. Remember how God sets you free. So let's continue reading in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And he said, For Adam was, not, was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman was deceived, became the transgressor. Yet she shall be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now, we need to ask ourselves a serious question. What does it mean that a woman will be saved through childbearing? This is not the salvation of the soul. Women are not saved spiritually through having children. That is not the issue at hand. You see, both Greek and English have different uses for that word saved. You know, in English we say, oh, that man was dr drowning, but the lifeguard swam out and saved him. Uh, you know, we also, my father used to say to us when we were uh, growing up, and he was teaching us how to make a budget, and he had us all open a bank account, and then each week we had to come in and show him how we spent our money, and he would say, how much did you save? He wasn't talking about spiritual salvation. Today in our generation, we're working on the computer, and someone said, did you save that document? It has nothing to do with the spiritual salvation. The Greek word save is uh, sozo. And uh, it also means besides salvation and is used in the, in the scriptures uh, and translated to preserve. It means to heal. Save means to restore to health. It means to rescue. It means to keep safe and sound. It means to be whole. Now listen, if God created us in a certain way and then sin came into the world and it came by Eve, uh, first of all by Eve, and uh, now death would reign throughout the world. Now God form, brings a way by which women can escape from that, be healed, be restored, be preserved, if you will. John MacArthur said it this way. While a woman may have led the human race into sin, women have the privilege of leading many out of sin to godliness. Listen, ladies. You have the next generation in your hands. You are the ones that carried them for nine months. You are the ones that gave birth and life to those children. You are the ones who primarily are the nurturers, the trainers of those children in raising them and bring, bringing them up. You have become the life giver, if you will. No life enters this world without a mom. She gives life to every single man and every woman on the planet. Everybody has a mother. Women, you have been empowered by God through his creation and through his redemption and through his empowering now. You have been empowered to rule the world, if you will. 
not by direct public teaching. Paul is making that clear. Not through the teaching. That's why we don't have women pastors. I remember the uh, message one time that Pastor Chris preached on women pastors, or at least brought that out. Not by direct leadership, but by nurturing, teaching, and training up that next generation indirectly you rule the world. In 1865 there was a, a man whose name was William Ross Wallace. He wrote a poem. I have it here but it's in the old English and really hard to understand so I'm not going to read you the poem but at the end of every verse he ended up with this, with this phrase. The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Indirectly, every mother has, through her nurturing qualities, has trained up those who will be out front, but those values are the values that mom built into them. And a woman will only be successful in the fullest sense of the word if she is living a godly life. Because now Christian women have a, another element, a godly element in their lives that now drive them to bring those children up in a way in which they will love God and serve him. And that's why in the end he says, if. They continue in faith. If they continue in love. If they continue in holiness. With, with self-control. If Christian women. It is Christian women who are impacting our world for Christ as they teach Christian principles to their children. How well I remember numbers of times in my life, my mom reminded me, she would say to me, Lee, I want you to know, this was after I declared my interest in the ministry. She would say, I always prayed to God that he would take one of my boys into his ministry. She's told me that a number of times. God took two of her boys into ministry. My mom had four boys. And uh, no, no girls. I had no sisters, but uh, she prayed God would take them. And, and I've often thought back and, and remembered the story of Hannah and how she wept before the Lord because she was unable to bear children. And finally, as she began to understand and and uh, be content, and she went home, and she found that she was pregnant and going to have a child. She prayed to God, and she told God, in fact, it actually happened before that. She told God that if she had a son, she would give that son back to God for his ministry. which she did. And uh, her son, Samuel, became one of the greatest leaders in all of Israel. And she took him after he was weaned and took him to the temple or to the place of worship there and gave him to be raised for the ministry and the priesthood. And I often remember that with 
my mom. I want to show you a slide. Guys are going to put it up there. Barbara and I uh, had uh, uh, gotten our training, gotten married. We had one child, Bonnie, who was 10 months old. And on April the 19th, 1965, I told you I'm an old man, we stood at Kennedy International Airport, and my mom was there. She was overjoyed that her son and his family were now going to Brazil as missionaries. But I do want to tell you there was pain in that. And I remember as I was stepping through the airplane, and I turned around and I looked behind me, there was my mom, and the tears just running down her face. She knew that she wasn't going to see us for four years. In those days, missionaries didn't come and go. You went for four years. As a matter of fact, when we came back four years later, we had three, not one. And there was mom, but she had made that pledge to God. And she was joyful until the day she died for the ministry that we had. God, in his wonderful grace, used Barbara and I to, es to establish, organize, and establish six churches in Brazil. You know who established those churches? Mom did. Mom did. Listen, the hand that ro the rocks the cradle rules the world. It was those principles that God had built into our lives that God used for his ministry. This is the greatest privilege, Mom, that you can have in this world is the nurturing of your children in the Lord. Let me show you another slide, one of my two favorites, my second favorite film. In the mornings, we always had family devotions together. At night, Barbara would go in and sing choruses and read Bible stories to our children before they went to bed, went to sleep, teaching them. And here they are. Now, you don't know what song they're singing, but I do. Running over, I'd sing it to you if I could sing, but I can't. Running over, running over. See their hand motions as they're singing. But here's my favorite picture, the next one. Favorite picture of all time. That's Bonnie, who's now with the Lord. And there's Cindy's brother, Philip. Looking at her mother, uh, he is looking at his mother with such awe in his face as she's telling him the Bible story. And you know what? He's sitting there like a sponge. And everything mom is telling him, he's, he's pulling into his heart and soul. And today, Philip is bringing up his children in the Lord. And there's Bonnie pointing down to the Bible. She's probably just beginning to read and pointing at something in the Bible that Mom is talking about. Listen, it goes on to the next generation and the next generation. Guys, like it or not, our moms are ruling the world. But not in an upfront way. They are doing it from the ground up through their nurturing. Moms, this old man this morning wants to tell you. This old man who has been through life and through it all wants to tell you. Nothing you do can ever compare with the training of your children to love the Lord. Nothing, nothing can replace it. Nothing will fulfill you more. 
It is only when you are living according to God's design, the way he made you, living in harmony with who you are, that you will experience that fulfillment. But you know this morning, and with this we'll be concluding, or this little section here, whether you are married and have children or not, this is the way that God has designed you. Even if you have no children. You know the Apostle Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it is not his will. That every woman be married. That every woman have children. I showed you a picture of Bonnie there. Bonnie was single. Bonnie never married. I know a little something about the struggles that single girls go through. But my challenge to you is... Use your feminine abilities, your nurturing, your caring, your sensitivity that are God-given gifts for His glory. Even if you think you don't like children, do it. And the real you will come out. I remember when uh, I was driving for Pocono Mountain School District. I had mostly junior high, high school kids, and I really enjoyed them to no end. After about eight years, I moved to the East Campus. And uh, the East Campus was not geographically as big, and so therefore the one run became two. And so I'd pick up all my junior high, high school kids, take them in. I had fun with them. I joked with them and, and tried to teach them things, etc. We get there, then we turn right around, go back on the same run, pick up all the little kids. I thought, oh my goodness, how can I ever relate to those little kids? Scared to death. Can you imagine those little kids scared me to death? And, uh, <clears throat> but I want to tell you, it wasn't long. Had several of these little kids come up. Mr. Thompson, or if they couldn't remember my name, Mr. Bus Driver, can you tie my shoe? I say, put it up here. And they put their foot up there, and I'd tie their shoes. Then one day, this little girl, and several times this happened, she came up to me and she said, Mr. Bus Driver, can you put my earring in? Oh, man, I'd never put an earring in a girl's ear in my life. Did I, Cindy? <laughs> man, I got that earring, my hands were shaking and scared to death. I just going to poke it right through and miss the hole and got it in. It wouldn't come out the other side. And I'm saying, it hurts, it hurts. She said, no, no. I got her head, I'm pushing that thing in. Finally got her earring in there. And uh, several times that happened with her. But you know something? I learned to tie little girl's shoes, and I learned how to put their earrings in. But guess what? I found out that I really enjoyed those little kids. Moms, you can only find real joy when you live in harmony with the qualities that God has given you and built into you. He has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for your life. If you have children, if you don't have children, you have those qualities. Use them for the glory of God. And let me tell you, you'll never regret it. And with this, I'll close.
I have told, usually I'm speaking to men, but it applies in this sense very much to women. It's not original with me, but it is true with me. I have never found a person on their deathbed say, oh man, I wish, I wish I had worked more in my life. I do find them saying, I wish I had taken more time for God. I wish I had taken more time with my family. Because in the end, nothing but nothing replaces your family and the role that God created you to fulfill. And so, 1 Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 15 ends with, Yet she will be saved through childbearing. She will be delivered. She will be healed. She will be fulfilled if she continues in faith, love, holiness with self-control. As I close this morning, I would like to ask all of you moms and all of you women and girls who are with us this morning just to stand. I want to pray for you this morning. Would you just stand up so I can pray for you as we conclude this morning? Oh, moms, girls, women, let's pray. Our God and I, our Father, we just thank you for the women that you have placed in our lives, the important role that they have, the impact they have made on us. Let us, Lord, as men, never think for a moment that we are who we are independent of the women that you have brought into our lives who have nurtured us and guided us, who have taught us. Lord, how I pray that you will be with each of these ladies, each of these young ladies who are with us today. How I pray your richest blessing upon them that they might sense, that they might feel in the depth of their souls the drive to use those qualities that you have placed in them and bring honor and glory to you and sense the freedom, the release, the fulfillment of knowing that they are living as you designed them. I commit each one of them to you this morning. I pray that you will be with them through the difficulties. Pray that you will be with them and help them, Lord, in all that they do, that you will be glorified. And I pray this now. In Jesus' name, amen.